appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here today to share in the discussion, um, both from uh, the, the, the conference itself as well as from actually legal counsel back from Mayo. Uh, uh, um, so, um, one of the uh, first uh, slides we've kind of already heard already, and that's basically that. Um, <coughs> Here, there we go. That any of the comments that I made today are my own personal comments, and to reflect uh, any any standing we only have, or any of the associations that I belong to, such as the Association of Water Quality. Um, so, um, one of the um, areas that obviously everybody's familiar with is what you call personalized medicine, or you call it individualized medicine. Um, but that's essentially where we're kind of at uh, today, and where we're where we're trying to get to, and that's the goal is that we treat each uh, individual as the individual they are. And part of what uh, obviously makes them that individual is their genetic makeup. So and being able to look at that and being able to make um, either, uh, so we want the medicine to be personalized, we want it to be predictive, we want it to be preventive, and um, obviously the, the patient is gonna be participatory in that. And so that's what Lee Hood refers to as the 4P, 4P medicine or P4 medicine. Um, the other reason I put this slide up there is so that you realize that in, a lot of times we talk about genes in isolation, BRCA1, BRCA2, but once they're in the body, they're not really in isolation. And in fact, more and more we're finding that they interact with several other genes in multiple pathways. There may be key genes within those pathways, um, and hopefully that they can become therapeutic targets. But not um, only are they involved with one disease, but they may be involved with multiple diseases not just one or two, and that's gonna be important as, as we carry on this discussion. So unfortunately, even though we can sequence for $1,000, uh, maybe the genome at this point in time, um, the, the joke right now is basically you get a $1,000 sequence, but if you wanted to interpret it, that'll cost you $100,000. So, um, so um, <coughs> I wanna talk a little bit uh, about bringing you kind of into our world. Uh, I say our, Elaine and I, in that we um, work with laboratory developed tests quite a bit. Um, and uh, how do we make decisions on actually developing the tests that we do? Um, and so um, up in the corner here, you can see sometimes it's based on um, guidelines that we get from our society. So for example, prior to 2002, um, really all we had was diagnostic testing for cystic fibrosis. Um, after 2002 and carrier screening, then all of a sudden, um, we ended up with the carrier screening test, the volumes increased, and that helped quite a bit with some of the testing um, that I'll talk about a little bit later. Obviously, our clinical colleagues <laughs> uh, across the street, they're the ones that know where the gaps are, and so if they have recommendations regarding tests to develop, we partner with them, um, and that's how we actually develop a, a lot of our new tests. New technologies, most of us in this field are geeks to start with, so um, we like new technology, we like some flash, um, and uh, so new technology, new ways of doing things is important to us as well. Um, we have uh, labs around the country, or clients around the country, and, and sometimes their clinicians uh, would like specific tests developed. And so we may develop tests based on that. We also work with about over 300 companies at this time in test development. <clears throat> sometimes there is a, an outbreak like the H1N flu, and so the CDC may come to us and say, hey, we'd like you to develop an assay to detect that and so we'll develop a, a test at that point in time. The other one that's important, um, I think, for us is, is uh, basically is working with rare disease foundations. So I, I have up here the Eric Arsenian Foundation, and uh, Eric Arsenian, of course, was a coach at Notre Dame, and uh, Nina Pick Type C um, is present in their family, and so he set up a foundation. Um, we actually obtained money from the foundation to set up uh, chemical testing as well as molecular testing. Um, it's not something that we would have set up uh, for financial gain. There's only 550 individuals worldwide that have been picked type C, so it's not something we would have done from that, but I think it's a service that we provide um, to, uh, the, um, to society. Um, <clears throat> so, um, I'm gonna back up just a little bit um, in that uh, I trained at Mayo in 86 to 88, and actually, uh, when Steve Thibodeau came to set up the clinical molecular genetics lab, that was the third commercial lab in the country doing molecular genetics. I actually trained as a clinical chemist 
and then came into clinical molecular genetics after that. The reason I bring that up is because if you look at the bottom of the slide there, our IP model at that point in time for tests was really that, um, especially for FDA approved tests, the royalties were really rolled into the purchase of the instrument and the reagents at that point in time. They were really kind of blind to us as laboratories. We paid the cost, but it was rolled into that. There were no royalties <coughs> for natural occurring analytes. I mean, you know, so I ran the clinical chemistry lab at Children's and we did electrolytes all the time. Could you imagine if sodium had it been patented and we would have had to send sodium to one laboratory in the country that would have done sodium? Just not feasible. And so, you know, it, really there was no uh, royalties at that point in time for those. Um, and the model was really successful for companies, investors, for clinical laboratories, and for patients. Most of the testing was done locally, unless it was very esoteric, very expensive, and then it was done at academic medical centers or centers that, uh, laboratories that were set up that had that expertise. So, <clears throat> as far as uh, this category, um, so we have FDA approved tests, and then we have laboratory developed tests. And this is where the category of BRCA1 and 2 would fall into would be a laboratory developed test. Mm -hmm. And basically, if individualized medicine is where we're going to go, if that's our goal, then we need to continue to translate the research assays into clinical assays. And that's kind of where um, Elaine and I live, is taking that information, those findings, developing tests within the laboratory, um, making them available to, to our patients. So there's got to be clinical utility. We have to do clinical analytical validation and verification. The analytical validation verification is a requirement you heard um, talk about uh, CLIA, the, and, and that's where that comes in. Um, there are regulatory considerations. We have CLIA. We also have the College of American Pathologists um, that certifies the laboratories. We have New York State that actually certifies individual tests that we can perform for New York State um, patients. We have um, the FDA. Now, there was a comment that the FDA is involved in LBTs. However, they've made noises over the last three or four years that they do want to regulate that space. Um, and so we're still waiting to see what exactly that means. Um, we don't know yet at this point in time. The laboratory industry as a whole, we feel that the CLIA regulations cover this um, well, along with the other regulation, uh, regulatory bodies. But the FDA is still making a decision with them whether they're going to step in there or not. Um, we also have financial considerations, obviously, and this quote is actually from one of the uh, sisters of St. Mary's in Rochester several years ago, basically, no money, no mission. Um, if we're going to continue to treat patients, then there has to be um, uh, the financial incentive to do so as well. Um, so uh, we look at the potential market. We look at whether this is a rare disease service that we're providing, which is a different question than how many tests can we perform. And then we do look at intellectual property and exclusive licensing. Is there intellectual property surrounding that NLA? And if there is, or the method that we're looking at, how do we obtain licensing to that? Or can we obtain licensing to that? Um, so there's the analyte that may be um, patented. There's the novel analytical method, um, not obvious. Um, obvious you know, so basically, in today's world, if it's sequencing, that's pretty obvious to most of us in the field, and it wouldn't be patented. Um, the clinical use of the method, um, and then uh, PCR, which that was really, to be honest, the first royalty that kind of caught the laboratory industry off guard. Um, when Roche said, if you're going to use PCR as a method, you owe us a royalty on every uh, sample or patient that you run. Prior to that, we really didn't have that experience. Um, and now there's also, uh, there tends to be also um, patents around software as well that we use within the laboratory. Um, all of this within a healthcare industry that's undergoing massive change at this point in time, and reimbursement because basically <clears throat> for laboratory testing, we um, you know basically lay out how much that costs, what the what the rate is above that. So it's an easy target for Congress and the government to say, well, we're going to give you five percent less for your test this year than what we gave you last year, and they continue to do that over the, uh, several years now, and so our reimbursement continues to go down. Um, technological advancements um, give us both uh, opportunity um, as well as challenges. So here's the cystic fibrosis gene, and I, I show this simply because um, you know there's over 1,500 uh, mutations um, or alterations within the gene that have been described as, as disease-causing. Um, and prior, really, to cystic fibrosis, 
And the recommendation that we look at 23 alterations for the Caucasian population, basically we didn't have good methods for doing things like this where we were doing them, um, all of those mutations all at one time. So normally we were only looking at one or two mutations. So really cystic fibrosis, when those recommendations came in, um, there needed to be some new novel methods of analyzing that needed to come about for us to be able to do this efficiently. One of the companies that jumped into this space early was Luminex. And uh, they basically, if you look over the far side, there's a grid of 10 by 10. So essentially we could look now at 100 different analytes at one time, or 100 different DNA sequences at one time. That was fairly novel when this came out. It really helped us to improve the efficiency of our testing for those 23 mutations that were common. Um, the other thing, though, about that was that Luminex started to charge for the use of the method clinically, which up until that point hadn't really been done either. I said you buy the reagents, you buy the instrument, normally the royalties for using that method are tied in at that point in time. Luminex decided, oh, there's another way to make money here. If you're gonna use it for research, that's fine. We're not gonna charge you an additional royalty, but if you're gonna use it for clinical samples, for patient samples, then we want a piece of that pie as well, so we're gonna charge you an extra royalty. So you have a PCR royalty, have that royalty, and Elaine's going to talk a little bit more about cystic fibrosis testing and some of the challenges we have there. Um, so what we did is, fortunately by this time, we had carrier screening up there for a while, so we said, okay, we need to do this in a more cost-effective manner, so we went looking for other methodology, which we could now at this point in time. So we use mass spectrometry. There's, uh, we use actually a mass spec uh, from uh, Sequinome. And with that methodology, actually it's much cheaper to um, perform the testing. And we can do uh, very highly multiplexed where we can now offer 106 mutations instead of 23 mutations. The other advantage of this, Sequinome is not a company that's charging us to use as a royalty to use this uh, method essentially to analyze at, on a per patient basis. So we basically pay that in the reagent cost and in the instrument back to the model that we were more so, uh, used to in the laboratory. Um, the, these differences in technology can start to help provide market distinction at this point in time. You don't need to have the gene patented to have market distinction. So at, at this point in time, uh, so ACMG, if you had a, a mainly Caucasian population, and those were the patients you saw, you were in northern Vermont, um, then the 23 alterations were going to serve the majority of your population. However, if you were um, like uh, Elaine and I were, were in, an, uh, in a laboratory that services in the United States and, and beyond, then really those 23 alterations probably weren't going to be um, sufficient uh, for African American population or for Hispanic population. So then we can now use the technology, we can expand the panel so that now we can service those other ethnicities as well as the Caucasian. So, Really what I talked about so far though was single mutation or single gene analysis, maybe multiple mutations within those single genes. Um, we also have to look for deletions and duplications or what's called copy number variation. But as you add more and more genes, if you go back to that original slide, remember the network of, of genes and proteins now that we're talking about, we need to be analyzing more than just one gene most of the time. Um, one gene isn't sufficient. We've been doing this in genetics for a long time. It's a karyotype, and we've been looking at uh, essentially the whole human genome um, at this point in time. But the resolution is fairly poor at this level. So of all the samples submitted um, for, especially in this case for um, children uh, with developmental delay or um, hypotonia or other things as, as a newborn, basically this is only going to detect alterations in about 5% of those samples. So 95% really didn't get an answer from this type of technology. So now we're using Array CGH. Um, this is a technology now that has much higher resolution uh, than a karyotype, and it looks essentially for large deletions and duplications that can occur, but with higher resolution. So now we've gone from a 3% detection rate to about a 15 to 20% detection rate in that same population simply with higher resolution. Um, but this technology now is looking at the entire genome at higher resolution. Remember, uh, so one of the questions was how many genes are patented, and if there's a third of the genome that's patented, how do we handle that in this type of instance? Do, if you saw a deletion that was involved and there was a gene in that region that was patented,
could you report that or, or do you not report that and then do you say you know you need to send this sample to XYZ company because they're the ones that have the patent with those that are doing this analysis. So those are questions that we're dealing with in the laboratory with this type of testing and they're different obviously thoughts on, on how to go about doing that testing. As far as the uh, array based, again, the recommendations now are not a period type um, for um, the newborns when you're looking for chromosomal abnormalities are really the recommendation is to go with array CGH because of that high resolution. This I thought was an interesting um, statement. It was that Ian Forbes uh, on basically a statement that was made in, in Concrete Cancer back in 2002 talking about personalized medicine but basically it says someday we're gonna get where we can analyze the DNA, administer customized cocktails of drugs, aiming at a few culprit genes that cause your specific variant. And we're basically there, that's where we're at today. Um, and so I'll just give you the example of non-small small cell lung carcinomas, basically the <coughs> leading cause of death in the US, 75 or cancer deaths, 75 to 80% of, of all lung cancers have a five year survival rate uh, or there's a five-year survival area of 10 to 15 percent, basically, with these, with these cancers. So there was just a paper actually that came out this week in Science Translation Medicine, um, where they showed by using essentially the genes that you see there, targeted mutations using genomics and immunohistochemistry, you know, um, that they could really change and improve patient survival at that point in time. Now the reason I chose this one in particular is because EGFR is one of the genes that was patented early on. And so at this point in time, there's still a question of whether you can actually use EGFR in a clinical diagnostic assay um, if, if you can't obtain licensing to it. And as far as I know, um, there's very few that have gotten licensing to EGFR. The other reason I point this out is because BRAF is another gene that's up there. So what's happened is basically in order to get a drug through uh, the FDA, the FDA has said um, to Big Pharma, basically, you have to have a drug and you have to have biomarkers to show which uh, patient cohorts or which patient populations that this drug is going to be effective in. So the large pharmas also either partner with diagnostic companies or have diagnostic companies. And so they develop an assay. They do the clinical trial, the large clinical trial that gets the drug approved along with the biomarker. And then basically um, the FDA recommends that if you're going to test for BRAF, for a specific alteration in patients with non-small cell lung carcinoma, let's say that you use the assay that goes along with the trial that where the drug got approved. That's fine, except when Pharma 2 comes along and says, oh, and we're gonna do a large trial, we're gonna look at BRAF, and now we're looking at colorectal cancer, so we're gonna develop a different assay, a different platform, same mutation is, is what was in the other study, but now we're gonna tie this diagnostic test to the drug in this case. So if you want to get this drug ordered and you want to get reimbursed for this drug, you have to use this assay. You can see very quickly, because of uh, certain genes like BRAF, that's going to become untenable in the clinical laboratory because we can't support multiple platforms essentially looking for the same analyte or the same mutation. So hopefully we get um, that straightened out <coughs> over the next little while. Um, next generation sequencing or high content DNA sequencing, obviously getting to whole genome, whole exome. And there's been some wonderful studies in the, in the literature showing that in about 25% of cases right now where there hasn't been uh, a mutation shown, especially again in, in a child that may have you know, some symptoms, they haven't been able to pin down what the gene involved is. And in about 25% of those cases if you do whole genome sequencing, you can actually determine what the mutation is. So um, wonderful technology along those lines, but not without its technical challenges. And these were mentioned earlier. Um, you know, there are some technical challenges as far as systematic random errors, you know, uh, detection rates, um, but there's biological challenges, as was mentioned, and we call them variants of uncertain significance. And one thing that makes everybody frustrated, the laboratorians, the clinicians, uh, the patients, is basically you do all this testing and you get back a report that says, we found a variant, yay. But we have no clue what that variant does. Um, and so very unsatisfying at that point in time. Um, and then intellectual property, obviously, um, we're here today because that's a model that's in transition. Um, and uh, so and exactly how we're gonna work through those things and then the difficulties in reimbursement. So as far as the recent SCOTUS rulings, um, from my understanding, we should be able to pursue testing for any analyte that's naturally occurring, including genes, mutations, methylation patterns, transcription patterns, 
whether healthy state or disease state related, or in response to exogenous uh, drugs, where you get a drug, natural occurring metabolism occurs, and you should be able to look at those metabolites, measure them, and then give back information regarding toxicity and those types of things. Practically, however, I would say right now with the suits and countersuits that we have going on, that it's really muddy the waters at this point in time. So didn't really, I don't think, has provided quite the clarity yet that we would like to see um, in the clinical laboratory. And so for the brave souls that jumped in, you got countersued. Basically, you have other souls like us that are uh, a little more reserved. And so we're going to wait and see what happens uh, with the lawsuits before we determine uh, what to do with some of this testing. Um, I will say that, uh, again, this week, um, there, uh, those of you that are uh, familiar with non-invasive prenatal testing, basically, instead of having to do amniocyte cultures um, and, and look at the cultured amniocytes, now you can look at um, the maternal serum, and there's enough fetal DNA present in maternal serum that you can um, determine whether the child has trisomy uh, 21 in particular is one of those, trisomy 13, trisomy 18. Um, Dennis Lowe uh, had uh, filed for the patent on that uh, quite a while ago, and you can see in the last paragraph, basically the court is invalidated and sequel known acquired the rights to Dennis Lowe's patent um, because it attempts to cover this natural phenomenon, which the court found to be non patentable eligible material. So, um, coming back to it again, why are we all doing this? Basically, we want to improve patient care. And the one thing to keep in mind in all of these and in all of these discussions is that really the needs of the patient come first, and that's really what you're 